Hi, everybody. I'm Kathy Ciceri, and I write books and I give workshops to teach kids uh, STEAM, uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math using everyday materials. Um, this morning, if you were um, able to tune in, I did a session with uh, fabric and fiber inventions. And I thought what I would do this afternoon is talk about some of the projects from um, several of my books and how I was able to adapt them from the usual type of in-person workshops that I usually go in and give at uh, schools and libraries to doing um, online workshops. And this summer, this spring and summer, I did online workshops, as I said, for schools and libraries. I did a whole series for the Monroe County Public Library System in Rochester and uh, in and around Rochester and also for Maker Camp. And I am uh, have some upcoming events for Maker Camp that I'll just mention. On Monday, I'm going to be, uh, as part of their Halloween series, I'm going to be showing you how to make a glowing um, disembodied hand out of masking tape and then light it up and even program it if you want to go that far with it. And also want to let you know that I am going to be teaching a robotics course based on my book, Bots. And that starts on October 28th, and we're still taking signups for that. So you can check makercamp.com or my website, kathysaseri.com, for details on those. So um, I'm just going to kind of wing it here and give a little talk about um, what I normally do and what my background is, and then what I ended up doing this year. And hopefully, it will. Um, help some of you teachers and parents who want to continue to share uh, STEAM activities with your kids, but don't know what to do if you don't have access to the school robotics lab, for instance. So um, I just want to start out saying, can you teach STEAM remotely, chemistry, physics, engineering, technology? I absolutely know that you can because I homeschooled my kids kindergarten through 12th grade, and we did all that stuff at home. And they still got into college. One of them is a graduate of RIT and the other one went to SUNY Purchase in New York State. So they are both graduates and therefore I feel like the grounding that they got was um, was sufficient, was not any worse really than they could have gotten in a lot of public schools. So you can do all of these things at home and you don't need to have specialized equipment was the other thing. Um, what I used most of the time are um, just school supplies and arts and crafts materials and kitchen basics, um, everything from ingredients to cooking tools, um, a lot of disposable bowls and plates and cups and spoons and knives. And you'll be seeing me use some of that today. Um, and household items, a lot of stuff from the dollar store. Um, and especially that's where I get a lot of um, cheap electronics. So LEDs and motors and uh, motors from little tiny dollar store fans that you can get and solar panels from garden lights and you'll be seeing some of that stuff. And even cleaning chemicals, which sound a little dangerous, but when you think about it, how many kids are making slime from borax, which is a, a type of laundry detergent. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with just things that you have at hand or that are easy to get in normal times in your um, local grocery store. And that is what I did science with all through my kids' schooling years. Um, so I am going to basically um, start off, I thought since BOTS is my most um, popular program and the one that I've done the most, I would show you what I would normally do at, you know, in times when I would go teach in person and some of the projects I did and how low level they are and then talk about how I had to even go a lower level than that to make them accessible to kids that were home at home and didn't really have access to even simple, you know, things that I would run out and get like plastic cups. So I know Rose, um, Rose and her talk today, which I really enjoyed, talked about an art bot. Um, this is one just like she was talking about. Um, and it is a plastic cup with a little DC motor that just runs on one battery and has a little cork. And I always have kids hot glue some kind of 
a off-center weight on it and that makes it shake. And the legs of the Artbot are uh, markers, waterproof markers, not permanent markers. And I usually cover the table with paper or sometimes I just put down a uh, paper plate and then you take the caps off and it'll draw. But this little project teaches kids how circuits work. Oops. And also how to troubleshoot because it just shook the wire right out of there. And the other concept that kids learn from this and some of my other projects is something um, that I learned from a, a robotics professor at Union College named John Ryeffel, and it is programmable bodies. So what I talk to them about is even though this little robot has no programming, you can still um, make it do certain things in reaction to its environment by the way that you design it. In this case, mostly how you put the weight, the weight that is spinning around and the weight that's on it otherwise. Some, because you'll see when I have a whole classroom full of these art bots that some of them are spinning in circles like a spirograph and some are making dashed lines across the table and it all has to do with the weight and the balance. So this little very simple project is very powerful just for teaching different STEM concepts. Um, and again, just, you know, can be made out of things from the dollar store, everyday stuff. A motor like this can be taken out of an electric toothbrush or a dollar store fan. Um, this is one of my favorite projects and it is a, a solar wobble bot. And it also used to be able to be made out of completely things that were recycled. The solar panel comes from the dollar store solar garden light and I have students take these apart. I give them the tools to do that. Um, this is where I'm starting to run into some problems because things that used to be common are now getting rare but CDs when that used to be a thing is the base of it and also the uh, cool windshield which the whole robot was designed around finding a use for this cool windshield. It's made from the top of a Slurpee cup. So it's a, a the top that would fit on the cup and it has a hole for the straw. Now I'm wondering whether they're going to start still be making things like this as they start phasing out straws. So you need to be flexible with your making things out of recycled stuff. But just to show you how cool this is, there's no soldering involved. Um, what I what I like about this project is kids get to take apart the solar garden light and see how the wiring works and the fact that this is um, very similar to the battery in that it's got a positive side and a negative side and you just attach it those wires to the motor wires the same way that you do in the art bot. Um, it just twists them together and puts some electrical tape and I go through a lot of electrical tape when I'm teaching in person classes. The one thing just to mention a little side note that you can't get anymore is the little motor. You need a very low inertia motor with a low speed to run off of this very low powered solar um, panel. And you used to be able to get them from old Walkman um, music machines that we used to have back in the olden times. Um, so nowadays I have to buy them in bulk on eBay. Although I did just find out that Adafruit, for which I do a lot of designing projects, um, has two different motors that will work with this project. So that's really cool. So Adafruit's DC motors will work with this. Um, let me show you how it works. Generally, I'd like to do this on a nice sunny day, but I also have a super bright bicycle headlight and that will also make it work. And I'm not sure if you could see that because it's kind of washed out, but it is moving around. So these are two really simple, really inexpensive projects that I was able to do in the before times that um, can't really do now. So what was I going to be able to do with students when they were at home. So I'll show you one project that I found a very simple replacement for. This is my gravity powered robot walker. 
and it is based on uh, something called a passive dynamic walker. And if you look that up, you'll see a million videos of it on YouTube from different universities, robotics labs. Um, basically, it kind of uses the same mechanics that uh, people do walking on their two legs to um, take the place of a lot of, you know, programming and engineering that would have to be done to, to think it up from scratch. So let's see if this guy's going to walk for me. And there he goes. He's taking steps and he's he's wiggling side to side because you will notice he does not have knees. And so in order to lift his legs off the ground, he needs to tip back and forth. And so this whole design, my version, as opposed to the versions that you'll see at different universities is made out of a bamboo skewer and some different size wooden beads and some card stock is cut out and bent from a template that I have to make the feet. And um, for weight to make sure that they swing, I just have some uh, short craft sticks glued on here. So all very simple stuff, but then I'm um, thinking, you know, that kids are not going to necessarily have the bamboo skewer and the beads and all this stuff. And I made a much simpler version. I'm just going to stop for a second. I see that there's a question about um, the name of the motor company. Um, the place where you can get motors that work with this, and you can just look up also uh, solar motors for, you know, um, student projects, but Ada Fruit is the company that um, has two different little DC motors that will work with this light here. And Adafruit also has a whole um, parts bundle to go with my bots book. And I'll be showing you, I can show you also some programming, which I did not do. But um, let me get back to <laughs> my first train of thought and I can go back if there is more time later. So I wanted to, um, yeah, Adafruit there is in the chat. So. I wanted to have kids be able to do some kind of a robotics project that I could teach online and that they could do with stuff that they were certain to have. So I'm thinking they're going to have school supplies like uh, index cards. And if not index cards, then they'll have, you know, a postcard. They'll have something that is a similar weight. And I happen to see this on Twitter. And on Twitter, it was called a walking horse. I've been calling it a walking robot dog because it reminds me of a robot dog called Spot that's made by Boston Dynamics. And it uses the same wobbling back and forth mechanism, whoops, except when it tumbles down. Let's see. You gotta get the, part of the project is getting the ramp at the right angle. There he goes. Well, he's a little off balance today but I've made quite a few of these and they do walk really nicely. And they are also very simple for kids to make. Okay, there it goes. So very similar. And I can go to the overhead camera and that might be a little easier for you to see what's happening there. Let me see if you can see it a little better from this angle. Come on, walk for me. Oh. He's kind of doing that wobbling. There he goes. So you can see it walking. So this version had pretty much the same educational value this version and all you needed for this was an index card and scissors and a pen. And I can show you really quickly how to make that, how, how quick and easy it is. This one is already folded. So you take an index card. I happen to have some index cards that had lines already on them. Put my board away for a minute. And 
the first thing you do is you fold the card to make the legs kind of like it's a table and on my measuring uh, pad here, this is five inches and I'm going to make it about an inch and a half. You can see I'm not a real engineer. I don't measure my eyeball. And hopefully these two legs are about the same and you can see I made that body much longer than this body. So we'll see if that works. And then the next thing to do is I'm using these lines as a guide and I'm going to draw where I want the head and the tail to go and the legs. And I'm going to cut this part off. And that long body is not in the version that I have seen online, but I feel like it gives it a little more wobble back and forth. And I even have a hack, which is to tape um, paper clips on either side and give it more weight the way that I have the beads on this version. And at this point, you just cut it along the lines to where you made the folds. When I'm teaching this with kids, I obviously do it much slower when they are all walk working along with me. But I just wanted to show you how simple this is to make. And oops, did I cut that? So the front and the back are symmetrical. And everything's cut. Okay. So except for that one. Okay. So we have the legs, we're folding them up. We have the tail and the head, we're folding them down. I'm going to flip him over or it over. So see how this one works compared to the one with the very short body. I make a little bit of a head like the head of the spot robot and the tail for some reason uh, I've read that it works better if it's curled and I think a curled tail looks cool so why not. And then the last thing is to go back and give the feet that rocker motion by cutting them at a curve. And I just mark it so that they're longest in the middle and go up a little bit on the side. That's probably even too much. And just kind of like a rocking chair. Just give them a little bit of a curve. And again, you're going to be teaching kids the concept of symmetry because you want the legs to be the same length and you want them to have the same curve. So that's my whole robot dog right there. And I'm going to see if this one walks any better or worse than the other one. So he kind of has a skittering motion, but he is indeed walking. Not sure if you can see the feet actually moving, but they, they are. Oops. And so that is the kind of project that I've been doing that give kids pretty much the same experience as the more complicated project. So I think that's a really cool discovery that I would not have made um, if, if we weren't all in this situation that we are in now where we can't be teaching kids in person as much. Um, so let me see what else I can show you. Um, let me go back to my front camera. Okay, I'm back. All right. I'll show you one more project that I have been doing. I've been doing this one with teens. It's a little more involved, but basically you are taking a, again, a strip of cardstock 
and in this case you're cutting little flaps and bending them and folding them and you get a fin gripper which is an actual thing it's, uh, made by a company called Festo and they uh, actually have their own cardboard version that they were doing one year at Maker Faire and because I didn't want kids to have to have to have a printer and have to print out the template I figured out a way to um, have them make it just from a, a strip of cardstock that it didn't really matter what the dimensions were um, they, could, you know, they could be very flexible and yet it still works the same way so again a really cool project that I just love and that is very simple to teach online and for kids to do online and I will move along here let's see how we're doing on time um, the project I was doing this morning was from my book fabric and fiber inventions which is published by make which is uh, the people producing maker fair and um, maker camp so you can look for that on their website so basically again I'm thinking what are kids likely to have at home old t-shirts and scissors and so this seemed like a good project and it is in my book um, and all you have to do if you saw this morning or you can go back and watch the YouTube video if it's still there is cut out the neck and the sleeves and then you cut um, strips along the bottom and tie them so you don't need sewing and that makes it seals up the bottom and then you have a tote bag that you can take shopping. This is obviously a very tiny one because I use kid t-shirts when I'm demonstrating because it fits in the camera in my workspace here. And um, as I was saying this morning, you know, it might look more like a crafts project than a, a science project, but you can talk about um, the invention of fabric and the, you know, the connection between the jacquard loom and the first um, computers because they were both programmed with uh, punch cards and all kinds of connections and just the whole engineering and chemistry that goes into creating uh, fabric that you know this is made from cotton cotton stretchy so it will allow you to uh, stretch the strips that you cut and tie them better and because it's a knit it's different than weaving so all these things can be brought up even in a, a crafts project. This is a typical crafts project. It's just a um, cardboard loom. But again, you can talk about all these things I was just saying. And this uh, thread that I'm actually weaving with is made out of strips of t-shirt that um, there are directions in the book to, to how to take one t-shirt, make one long strip and use it as t-shirt yarn and that can be used in all kinds of projects. So um, that's how you can get the science part into the STEAM. And I'll show you a few more projects from Fabric and Fiber Inventions. Uh, let's see here. So again, this is a crafts project from my childhood. I know they still sell kits to do this. I think in my day, we used to make them ourselves. Um, it's like a tube knitter. It's made from a wooden spool that thread used to come in and um, you just tap some very skinny nails on top. So I've got the directions for that because I thought it would be cool to make that and I made my own little stick that you knit with from a um, bamboo skewer and just a bead glued on there. And then as you can see, I, you can make a nice little tube of knitting. It's very relaxing. I was doing this last night to have a sample to show you. And um, you can take this long tube of, of knitting and you can you know, connect it and make pot holders. You can make things with it. But the cool thing that ties this very directly right into technology is um, that one of the engineers that I interviewed for the book made a stretch sensor using this knitted tube. So here's another tube that has been knit 
on my same little spool, but along with the regular thread, I use conductive, along with the regular yarn, just acrylic yarn, I use conductive thread. And I think this also, uh, no, this was not from Adafruit. I was going to say it was, but I think I had to uh, go to a special place to get this type of um, conductive thread that has the property that it will allow more electricity to flow when it is stretched. So it is a stretch sensor. And I will again go to the overhead to show you what it's going to do. And I'm just showing you this for the coolness factor. Uh, if you were going to do this with kids, it would be, well, it would be more than I would do in my usual teaching because I'm usually only there for one session. If you were working with kids and you were able to get them materials, this is definitely something you could do. Um, to test it, this is a little more complicated. This is my um, tester that is, the instructions for this are in the book. I attach three LEDs and I use that standard, which is very pretty looking, of taking the wire leads and using a jewelry um, tool to twist them into different shapes. So you have the positive and the negative. And then I've got regular conductive thread here that probably is from Adafruit um, to attach these to two snaps. And I can use this for different uh, fabric sensors that are all in the book and there's a little battery in there. So right now I've just got some alligator clip leads here and I've got this in the camera and if I stretch it, it will hopefully, you can see that it lights up. And I'm not sure you can see, but usually I mean, it needs to be a little bit darker, but usually you can see different numbers of lights lighting up. So it's kind of a, a measure of how much it's stretched. So another way that you can just make that connection between an ordinary craft that is very simple to do with technology. And now I'm going to move on to paper inventions. So when I was doing paper inventions workshops, I my uh, chapters in that book are science, technology, engineering. And I concentrated on the uh, math chapter. Although this is from the engineering chapter and I just thought I would include this. This is again something that you could have kids do. I, uh, this was not something that I did in my one-off workshops but basically making structures out of rolled up paper and they're very strong and I found all kinds of links to people making furniture and building buildings out of rolled up paper. Um, when I have taught classes in person I've had kids make um, geodesic domes out of rolled up newspaper that they actually could climb in and kind of use it like a clubhouse and that was always a, a fun thing to do. But um, what I did for my online one-off math things was I would show them some different math projects and send them the instructions. We wouldn't do this. Um, actually, I think I did do it online, but a hexaflexagon, uh, hexaflexagon. Um, Vi Hart is the person who popularized these things and they're a little bit like fortune telling constructions that we made as kids. This one, that's, oops, I think I'm opening it up the wrong way. Let me see if I got this right. So it is a three-sided shape. So the first side is colored with orange dots and then you can flip it open that's the second side, and there's the third side. And uh, also good as fidget spinners. So I did actually do this with kids in a longer session with teens. And you can make all kinds of different shapes and sizes and colors and different designs. And Vi Hart, Vi Hart, V-I is um, how she spells her first name in H-A-R-T and look her up and she has all kinds of cool things for how to make these. I really love them. It's also in my book. Um, but just a very, very simple thing that you could do is to make a Mobius strip, which I remember blowing my mind when I was a kid 
that these kind of things could ex uh, exist. I uh, have kids cut strips of paper and I actually would have them before I even, uh, you know, started the class, I would say cut a bunch of strips of paper and have some tape ready and a scissor ready and then we'll be ready to go. So I had several projects and uh, this also is made out of strip of paper. So that, that kind of saved time. Um, generally the two strips are the same color. This is what I happen to have lying around. So it's two different colors, but you make one long strip. And if you've never made a Mobius strip before, it's just a loop with a twist in it. And different things happen with different numbers of twists. And I actually forgot my little hack here for how to attach this. So here's my secret hack. Tape it to your table. Take the other end, give it that one twist. Now pick up the tape and tape these two ends together and you've got your one twist. And the tape does have to go across the whole way and it helps even to have tape on both sides because this is now a wonderful shape from a branch of geometry called topology. It only has one side and you prove that by taking your pen and drawing all the way around and I just move the paper and leave the pen on the table and it's kind of bleeding through but I'm going to eventually meet up to where I started and without lifting my pen I've drawn on the entire one side of this shape and then again if you've never done this you have to do it just for fun you just cut along that line and of course it's much longer than it seems like it should be and then instead of having two you have one gigantic loop because math. So a very, very simple steam project with paper and not much else. So my next book I'm going to talk about is musical inventions. So as I went through musical inventions, looking to see what I could do in this Paper plate is what I was saying. I use plates for everything, but right now they are on my work table, helping me keep stuff from getting all tangled up. I've discovered a bunch of uh, projects that were actually very simple. You know, I had things like make your own guitar, which took a, you know, a, a cigar box. So not expensive, but tools and time and everything, but things that you could do in an hour online. So, um, the first one, and I've done this at Maker Faire New York, is to make a oboe from a straw. And all you do is cut your um, reed here. An oboe, of course, is a double reed instrument, as I'm sure everyone knows. And so you just kind of cut it, looks like a duck bill. I don't know if you can see that there. And then I'll have to go back to the front to show you what's going to happen now. Okay, so um, the very technical part of this is that you chomp on it with your back teeth. Oops, and I shouldn't do that on the side with the microphone, excuse me. I don't know if you have to have that furrowed brow as I do, but All right, I'm sorry if this is uh, sounding weird through the microphone. And I'm going to blow this so you might want to lower your volume. Let's see how this works. <laughs> Didn't chomp enough. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
so again, it's um, it's musical and it works, but where's the science come in? Well, there's a whole explanation in my book of um, the uh, connection between wavelength and frequency and frequency, of course, the higher the frequency of a sound wave, the higher the, the note sounds that or the uh, the tone of it sounds and the frequencies related to the wavelength and the wavelength is related to the physical length of the um, thing that you're blowing and your sound wave is actually happening inside your tube here. So not only are you talking about physics, but you're helping kids understand that air actually is a physical thing that is made up of little molecules and that they are all bouncing around when you do something like and in order to prove that the uh, wavelength changes and the frequency changes, you do this. And again, you can measure it and have them play notes that sound nice. But if you do get that idea that now I've got a shorter straw and a shorter wavelength and a higher frequency. So there's your science in that. Another cool project that I have actually done with kids online is to make a mini string bass. I have a uh, kid sized string bass project in the book made with a pail from Home Depot. But um, in this version, I'm just using string and it's just tied to a stick to make it easy to hold on to. And then it's poked through a styrofoam cup, which again, you know, styrofoam is evil, but um, handy for crafts that I do at least and inside there's a little toothpick just to hold that string in there and this of course creates a um, resonator so that it will make the sound louder and let's see if you can even hear this and that is the note is changing because I'm changing the tension which is another way to change the frequency. It's the tension of the object that is vibrating. So again, very simple craft that then relates to physics. All right. Oh, one more paper popper. Now, one of the other things that will change a sound wave is the strength of it will change the volume. So this is a folded up piece of paper. I can uh, unfold it to show you. And again, I've done this with kids, just fold it up. This is actually something that, again, in the olden days, kids used to do themselves to annoy the teachers. So it's something that kids can definitely do. Um, what you do is you hold it in such a way that you're creating two air channels there and then the strength of your flicking it will move the air and create an airway uh, sound wave that changes in volume depending on how much energy you're putting into it. So I'm going to put a bunch of energy in and let's see how loud this sounds. Oh, a little bit of a pop. I think it wasn't folded quite sharply enough. But again, one more very, very simple project from again, musical inventions that relates directly to physics and all kinds of cool science. Let's see, I'm going to give it a little bit more of a backswing here. Oh, there, there we go. All right. Hope I haven't popped anyone's eardrums there. All right. Um, and I still have a few more minutes. And so I am going to attempt a feat of daring. And I am going to do something from Edible Inventions. This is messy. I'm going to turn around here and get my tray of messy stuff. Whoops, and I just knocked over a robot. I don't generally have my electronics and my chemistry projects on the same table. And maybe I will move a few things just in case. But I did do 
some edible inventions projects and they were so much fun I thought I would take a chance and see if I can get it to work here. Um, do we have a Q&A? No, we don't. Okay, I'm going to close that. All right. So um, I have two different projects here. I'm going to show you the amazing one. And this was something I learned from YouTube because YouTube is a wonderful place to learn things. So you may have done that project where you take some cream and shake it up and it becomes butter because it is a colloidal mixture and you're shaking the particles of fat out of the liquid buttermilk that's left. And what this person on YouTube discovered, and it actually was a YouTube hack that worked because a lot of times they don't, you got to test it, is that if you use, instead of a regular smooth sided bottle to shake it up, if you use a water bottle with ridges on the side, that makes it go from a project that would take half an hour to about five minutes. And I ran out this morning and got super fresh, heavy cream from King Dairy in Schuylerville, New York. Um, and it should work even a little bit faster than normal store bought and cream because it doesn't have stabilizers in it. So let's see if I can do this in order without looking at the directions. I'm going to take my cold water out of the refrigerator and I'm going to pour it in this bowl. And actually, maybe I will move some of my other things and get this on my tray here. So when it starts overflowing, oops, I don't make too much of a mess. All right, I've got my plastic tray here to contain my mess. And here's my crackers ready for the butter. All right. So I'm pouring cold water into a bowl. And it makes a nice tinkly sound. I am taking my fresh cream. It does work with store-bought cream. This cream is so fresh, it's kind of uh, risen to the top there. And I'm going to pour it into my bottle. And not that much. Little lumps in there even. All right. So about that much. And then you just shake it. So if this is a project that you were teaching online, you have to figure out how much tolerance you and your children that you are teaching have for sitting and watching you do this for five minutes. You might want to have a little patter going, some other things to talk about, talk about colloidal mixtures, talk about foams. A foam is a mixture where the air is mixed into liquid and can't be separated. And I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it, but there's a point where it turns into whipped cream, which is also cool to just squirt out and show the kids. Might be at the whipped cream phase already. Oh, not quite. Actually, I think I may have gotten to the past the whipped cream phase. And it goes from whipped cream to butter. You'll start to hear all the butter fat that's congealed into one thing. You'll hear it thunk. All of a sudden, it's really a cool thing. Needs a few more minutes. If you have any questions, this would be a good time to ask because I'm just going to be shaking here for another minute. Hopefully, I won't go over my time. Oh, come on. The other edible invention project that I did that I don't think I'm going to get to today is I made lemonade and mixed it with some, actually in the book I mix it up with um, some watermelon that I run through the blender. But what I was going to show you today was mixing it with some grape juice because watermelon is out of season where I live. 
and then put some baking soda in it. So you get kind of a carbonated drink. And of course you get, you know, that baking soda and vinegar effect. Lemon juice works the same as the vinegar and you get some nice bubbling over for a nice finale. So I think the finale today is gonna to be if I get my butter out. When you cut the sh straw shorter, was the sound higher or lower? So it gets higher the shorter you make it. So think about if you know the instruments in an orchestra and the difference between a piccolo and a flute. Piccolo is much teenier and it's much higher. Or a bass, a bass violin versus a regular violin. So the longer and bigger and looser something is if you're talking about strings, the lower the note is. And the more tension and the shorter it is, the higher the note is going to be. How do you remove the butter? If I can get the butter made, I've got a few minutes. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Can you see that? It is there. All right. Yay. All right. Scissors. That's how you get the butter out. We've got a lump of butter in there and you just cut with some scissors that you don't mind getting greasy. Just cut that thin plastic water bottle open. I don't think it was totally separated, but I'm going to call it enough. And then you dump it. Actually, it doesn't look too bad. Dump it into the cold water, which rinses off any excess buttermilk and makes it solidify. Yeah, it's not quite buttery, but that is how it works. It's kind of in between, oops, butter and very thick whipped cream. But I'm still gonna do the spreading it on my cracker because that is the reward. So, yeah, it's kind of like super soft butter. And I will take a taste. Sorry for the crunching noises, but taste buttery. Probably need another couple of minutes of shaking. I'm told we're fine this session runs over, but we need to end by 4.55. Um, quick show of hands, should I make the lemonade? Should I make the lemonade mess? Or any other questions? Hearing nothing, I've got seven minutes to play with. I guess I'll do the lemonade. Let's see how that comes out. All right, here's my grape juice. Here's my lemon. And you know, part of Edible inventions, even though we're talking about chemistry is cooking techniques. So talk about how if you roll your lemon a little bit, the juice will come out a little easier. I've got a very dull kind of butter knife here because I want to make it kid friendly, but it still goes through the lemon. And I'm going to squeeze the lemon juice into the grape juice. Can you see the grape juice there? And again, this is going to be the same as the vinegar and baking soda volcano, but in a cup and then you can drink it. I'm only going to put in half a lemon there. And of course, the one thing I forgot was paper towels. Excuse me. Got some tissues off camera here and that's what I'm going to use. All right. So I've got my baking soda. If you wanted to actually drink this, I probably would not put in more than half a teaspoon. But um, let me see if I can get this where you can see it a little better. All right, and I'll move my knife here. All right, so here's my grape juice with lemon juice in it. And I'm gonna put in a whole teaspoon because let's make a mess. But it's 
not going to be as tasty to drink. Well, obviously I'm not measuring this with a real spoon. So we'll just see how this goes. The other cool thing with using grape juice is uh, it actually turns color with the pH too. So I'm going to go to my overhead camera and you might be able to see that it's turning a little bit blue. I don't know if you can see in the middle. Whoa, there it goes. Making that cool mess. A little bluer in the middle with the uh, change of pH. And so that's my grand finale. And of course, having kids make this is a lot of fun. And again, it's stuff that they're liable to have or be able to find quickly, easily, cheaply. And you can teach. You can see it's actually very blue there. Um, actual science and technology and engineering and math topics with everyday stuff. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it was useful. And um, feel free to contact me. I'm at kathysaseri.com. I am um, available for author talks and presentations and homeschool consulting and uh, any, any just conversations you want to have. I love hearing from parents and teachers and people that are involved in STEAM education. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks, Jenny, for liking the visual. Bye, everybody.